Better put these on or I'll never be able to read this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's six o'clock uh, mountain time. Um. Thank you all for attending to this week's uh, fly tie and te fly tie and techniques uh, uh, program. Uh, we have a treat tonight. Uh, we've had a treat every night that we've done one of these things. To be really honest with you, but uh, we have another treat tonight. We have a, a gentleman by the name of Sun Tao. I bet you none of you have heard of him. Um. He's kind of broke in on into the fly tying uh, annals of history real quick here in the recent years. But Sun is an award-winning tire who's also a master sergeant in the uh, U.S. Army. Sun won the fifth annual Project Healing Waters National Fly Tying Competition after tying for only one year. Since then, he's had flies published in books, demonstrated on the fly fishing show circuits, and gives presentations to various clubs around the world, around the U.S., excuse me. Sun is well known on various social media platforms. One of his noteworthy innovations includes the 60 second fly tie in videos on Instagram. Sun started recording these clips in 2017 to show folks, a very, uh, show folks various dry fly techniques. His love of educating others had led to 200,000 followers across Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Sun is an ambassador for Abel Reels, Fish Pond, Douglas Outdoors, Sims Fishing, Wapsi, Semp uh, not Semperfly now, uh, and many others. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so with that, uh, I'm going to turn the... Uh, Turn the uh, presentation over to Sun, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining. So tonight I'm going to be going over uh, some dry fly techniques. While uh, dry flies may not be the top producing way to fish, everybody always envisions going to some crystal clear mountain stream with trout rising everywhere, where in reality they only happen for a small portion of the day. If you're lucky... Rest of the time, you're either nymphing or you're casting dry flies to get some practice cast in. But on those rare occasions where you actually hit the stream at just the right time and you're able to throw those dry flies out there, it is, to me, one of the purest forms of fishing where I'll break out my little seven foot six bamboo rod several times a year, throw in a big bushy dry fly and hope something bites. And if it does, then it's just icing on the cake. So my love for dry flies began many, many years ago when uh, I first started uh, fly fishing and then a gentleman, a, la a late gentleman by the name of Tony Spizio um, gave me a tour of his little bamboo factory that he had down in his basement, showing me how he made these split canes. Um, Tony was the most wonderful individual with a huge heart and he loved to educate people. And he told me more about split canes than I could possibly ever remember in a lifetime. And he went out of his ways to make sure that like uh, I was really set up with knowledge on how to throw dry flies, how to use slow moving rods and all nine yards. And ever since then, just with that time that that gentleman spent with me, uh, my infatuation with dry flies and cane poles really exploded. And I always wanted to make sure that I got some dry fly fishing in somewhere in the world, regardless of uh, where I'm at. So I always told at least two rods with me wherever I go in hopes that I'm always able to cast at least one dry fly. That includes Alaska for salmon. So if you ever go to Alaska during August, silver salmons will take top water flies. Just throw something big, pink and bushy out there and you'll get a 12, 15 pound salmon take a dry fly. It's it's a thrilling experience. So for tonight, uh, one of the flies that I really love to tie is a stimulator. In this case, we're here, we're going to tie a royal stimulator. I started tying this fly uh, roughly in about the end of 2016, I think I was tying for a period of about 10 months. And when I was paging through various different publications, this fly caught my eye because um, it requires a lot of different techniques in one pattern. And I figured if I could master this one dry fly pattern, I could pretty much tie almost any dry fly. At least that was the theory in my head. And it's a, at that time, it was a very difficult pattern because I was still relatively new to tying. Um, 
And I'm one of those that I have to make a mistake in order to really properly learn where I can't sit there and watch a 20 minute YouTube video. Um, I could read a book and read all the, the steps on how to tie it. And that hits home more to me and me doing it self, my, itself versus watching yeah. somebody else do it. So I tie probably about 50 to 60 simulators over the span of about two or three months. And yeah. then whatever mistakes that I made, uh, mm -hmm. what I tell everybody is when you do make a mistake, just stop what you're doing and then just go back and basically undo that mistake. And then basically just retie that one portion that you had messed up on. And that's how you basically perfect various different techniques. Like stop when like a black raptor mm -hmm. appears. Yeah. So whoever is controlling the view, video is it that view? It'll yeah. So I'm it'll I'm gonna I'm gonna forward. mute everybody and then if you don't um, mute yourself. And there's today. All right, there we go. Something about a black raptor today. <laughs> So I'm going to switch, uh, before I switch cameras, I'm going to go over a little bit about material selection before we actually get into the tying itself. And to me, that is probably the most important aspect of tying any fly, regardless of the type of fly, is the proper selection of material. And it all starts with the hook. There's, uh, for somebody that's new, there's a wide assortment of hooks from tiny little midge hooks to curve hooks to straight shank hook, 1XL to 3XL streamer hooks medium wire, heavy wire, et cetera, et cetera. And each fly has a specific hook where I feel that it, it pairs with that style of fly and that style of fishing the best. And with, with the stimulator, it basically is roughly a two or three XL hook that is curved that could be utilized either for a stimulator or for a hopper because of the way that you're going to fish that pattern. In this case right here, I'm using an A-Rex uh, 531 freshwater hook, the medium wire that's three XL. You can also use a TMCO 200R and a Firehole 718 or some of the other popular, but they all basically copy the exact same design where it's basically a 3XL hook that's curved. Uh, next will be the thread that you use. So anytime you're tying a fly that requires hair, whether it's elk hair, deer hair, you, you want to make sure that hair is strong enough that you can actually flare that hair, but not so strong that it's going to break that hair. Again, that's going to go into threat pressure. We'll talk about that in a minute. But additionally, if you use hair that, that has been traditionally used to uh, cinch down on hair or spin hair, it's generally really heavy, th uh, heavy thread in the UTC 200, 280 range, which is way too big to tie small dry flies. So the advent of GSP made it like phenomenally easier for anybody that ties small hair wing type patterns where you could use super strong thread that has a really thin diameter. So you're not building up bulk on that fly. In this case right here, I'm going to basically use uh, a GSP 50. It's a Sepify nettle silk. Beavis, UTC, they all make various different forms of GSP thread. You can even go as small as a 12 watt GSP, which is about 50 denier. But depends on, again, it depends on the size of your hook. The larger the hook, the bigger the diameter of thread. Otherwise, you're going to be wasting a lot of thread by doing a lot of unnecessary wraps. So it's just basically figuring out um, the max number of wraps you can do in order to secure the, the material in there without adding too many additional wraps and creating unnecessary bulk on that fly. Take a look at real life bugs. Many, most of those bugs are really slender profile. And if you're using too thick of a diameter thread, you're gonna add said un, uh, additional bulk that you do not need. Um, after the hook, the thread, the hair. So when it comes to hair, I will have all these tiny little patches like land all over my tying room. Every time I travel somewhere and I, I always want to hit the local fly shop. One, I like to support local fly shops. And then two, I make a beeline right to the hair aisle because finding good quality elk hair is almost impossible. Not every pack that you're going to pull off the shelf is, is basically quality hair that I a good looking fly. Will it work? Absolutely. But if you want to tie a stimulator, you want to be able to tie it easier, an elk caddis, tie it easier, uh, 
anything using elk hair, you have to very you have to look for very specific packs. So what happens is you get elk hair that is harvested uh, during the winter time. It takes a while for them to cure the hides to cut it all up. Those elk will have a ton of underfur. So like this one right here has a lot. And what that underfur does is one, it's a lot more that you have to comb off, but two, it causes the hair to basically push out because of all the underfur, underfur, and then eventually all the hair will start to curve. So as it sits there the long for a long period of time before it actually makes it into a pack and onto the shelf, that hair has been curved for quite a while. So if I cut this piece off right here, I'm basically fighting with hair, this hair to try to get straight line tips all the time because the hair is just naturally curved. Can I do it? Yes, eventually, but I'm going to go burn through a bunch of hair. That's if I'm trying to get, you know, a good quality looking fly. If I don't care, then I can tie it on there, but the OCD in me just won't allow it where this, basically I just keep this around as an example. And that is the vast majority of packets that you will find that are hanging on the shelf. If you look closely enough, eventually you find you'll find some hair that does not have a whole lot of fur. So this one here does not have a lot. And you just see how flat that is. So I cut off any clumps off of this right here. Most of the hair are going to be really, really straight. And that makes stacking the tips and keeping them all in line 10 times easier and just creates a better looking fly. So again, that goes back in the fly selection or uh, material selection. And I may go through 10, 15 packs that are hanging into in a fly shop. I might find one that's actually usable and I'll snag it up in a heartbeat. And that's been the case almost every fly shop because they don't get to pick whatever packs arrive from the distributors, just whatever shows up. It's just really up to you to, to sort through it. If you order online, it's going to be, like I said, 90% chance that you're going to get one that will probably look like this. And it causes a lot of frustration. So that's another reason why going to a local fly shop is awesome. So that's the hair. Uh, hackle. I prefer saddle hackle because I tie very specific sizes. And then once I'm able to size out that hackle, then I have, I could tie roughly about 1,500 flies off of this one saddle right here because this one right here is all 14s and 16s. And then this one right here is all 12s and 14s. That's the case with all my saddles that I have is they're all sized accordingly. And I'm able, I know that if I'm going to tie an elk hair cat and they're going to be size 16, I can just grab this off the, the my wall. And I'm going to have to sit here and fiddle around with the hackle gauge. And I know every one of these hackle is going to be that size. Now, the downsides to saddle hackles, they're very, very expensive. This one here is a platinum. You were to go out and you happen to find a platinum, this will probably run you about $250 to $275, which is not feasible for the vast majority of people. So what you can do is they do have the Whiting 100 packs that are already pre-sized. You can grab one of those. So you can still tie a bunch of flies for roughly about 20 bucks. Other alternative is buying a neck. And a neck is very inexpensive. The downsides to a neck is, well, the positive side of the neck. One is the cost. And two, it has a wide range of different feather sizes. Everything from little pin feathers at the actual neck itself, where you can tie down to even a size 30, all the way to the big feathers in the back where you're basically using for streamers. So if you're predominantly tying very specific size ranges from, like, let's say most dry fly tires will tie 12 to 16, you will find on most, most necks that somebody ties a lot of dry flies has a huge bald spot in that region because those are all the feathers they're pulling off. And then the other thing, and let me go over a little bit more about the necks. It's pretty important for anybody that, that buys the necks, which is the vast majority of people. I'll pluck one of the bigger feathers in the back that I'll probably never use explain this so if you're using a neck you have to take a look at the rectus which is the stem here on the hackle itself it's going to start off really thick at the bottom and then eventually it's going to thin out the point where it thins out it's going to be basically consistently that same size to a certain point when you get to about up here so in a neck hackle probably roughly about here without really looking at it because i don't have the light on to about here, that's considered the, the usable portion of that hackle right there. You go too far below or too high up, then the barbs will be different sizes because it's basically si uh, the size of it changes based on how thick the stem is. So easy way to look at that is when I 
preying all this hackle down here, you can see how it gets much bigger down there on the bottom. And then up here during the usable portion, it's all roughly about the same size. The advantage with the saddle is it's all the same size, basically from the very top all the way down to the bottom. But ultimately, you do end up paying the cost for that. Next is the peacock curl. So I will prefer anytime I use tie a fly that requires hurl to use hurl from an eye itself. The advantage of basically tying using the materials from the eye is if you take a look at all these hurls here at the base of the eye, these every one of these will be much fuller and fluffier than anything you will buy out of the, of the strong peacock curl packages like this right here. Now, there's nothing wrong with using one of these, but it would take me about six to seven of these hurls compared to me using maybe just three of these. That's the difference in the, the basically the fluffiness. So a lot of people look at the various different patterns that I post up online that uses peacock curl. And a lot of them always ask, you know, how do you get it so fluffy and cool? Well, the one is selecting the right hurl makes it all the difference in the world. And two, there's another technique I'll show you, which actually reinforces the peacock curl to make it a lot more durable. Whereas Hurl is great and all. It has that really natural luminous sheen to it, which is attracts fish's attention without being overly bright. But at the same time, it's also very fragile. And uh, trout do have tiny little teeth. Some have bigger teeth than others. And if you're not reinforcing that hurl, one good uh, take on a trout will basically destroy that fly. When I tie a fly, I like to la make sure that fly lasts at a minimum of 12 fish before it starts to fall apart. Uh, stimulators have a reputation of basically falling apart real fast because of whatever material is on there. And I can attest that one of my stimulators will last 24 to 30 fish before it starts falling apart. And I'm about to go and show you on how we do that. I'm going to transition over to the big camera. So you don't have to look at my ugly mug anymore. So said using simple fly nano silk on here and just starting the thread like normal, like you would on any other hook. Scissors is also another amazing tool that often takes for granted. These are German made scissors. They're Renome, Renome or however you pronounce it. They're all micro serrated and it cuts through GSP like butter. So, a lot of people will look at the cost of these scissors and they'll be like, oh God, I'm not paying 45 bucks for a pair of scissors. Big difference is these scissors are going on four years old and I have never resharpened them, never used anything. And they still just slice through GSP and anything else I use. So is that 45 bucks worth it for four years of usage so far? I think so because any of the other common scissors you buy out there, the Dr. Slicks or whatever, after years of hard use, you pretty much will have to sharpen them some way or another. So I think the cost justifies it. Mm -hmm. uh, so first material we're going to tie in is the tail. Through the elk hair into the stacker to align all the tips. So like I was saying, with selecting the right hair, this is what you get when you're using hair that is relatively straight without a whole lot on fur. That's just a quick stack. You can see how basically about all the hair is pretty much well aligned. Um, at this point right here, one of the things that I will always do is if I see a hair that is not stacked well or splayed too much, I take that extra time and I'll pick it out. And that way I can maintain that same consistency across all my ties. If I see broken tips on there, I'll take my tweezers, pull it out. Is it going a little overboard? Absolutely. You do not need to do that, but that's how I like to say that, you know, I put the best effort into whatever fly that I'm tying. So the other part to it, when it comes to consistency, is the proportions of the fly. In order to get the proportions correct, single, simple little step that you could take is just basically measure it out. I like to have my tail roughly about a hook shank from just before the eye to where it starts to bend. I measure it out just like that. I do it on every fly, regardless of the size of the hook. You're going to have the same tail proportions from fly to fly. From there, the part that a lot of people will start having problems with when they tie in that the hair is that it'll start to spin on them around the shank because the shank is very slick. 
So one method to prevent that is using a pinch wrap. And all a pinch wrap is, is taking your thread, run it in between your fingers while you're pinching the hair to the side, the shanks, and then run it down through the other side and then apply that slight pressure. So I don't go full bore pressure yet. If I do, yeah, it'll lock that portion back in here in, but it's going to flare all this hair out. I want this hair to roughly sit near the top of the shank. So what I do is, while I maintain that pressure and squeezing that hair, I'm going to start running my thread up the shank while maintaining control of that. So as I get to a certain point, I'll put a little bit more pressure onto that, and I'll slide my fingers forward. And I'll continue to do this until I get to basically where my stop point is, which is roughly about the three-quarter point. That's where we're going to tie in the wing eventually. And then from there, I'll flare it. Now I want to lock this thread in so that it does not roll around while we tie. And I'm still maintaining pressure by squeezing the hair to the side of the shank so it doesn't roll on me. And all I'm doing now is just running back over with my thread, making sure that everything's nice and secure. So I'm going to exaggerate something back here to show you a common mistake and how to fix it. Basically, you flare it too much. You're pulling down here and here since the hair is hollow. That tail is going to get all big and bushy now. And if you want a more streamlined tail, what you could do is basically use your thread pressure. Use the thread as your tool to fix that. And all you do is just basically run over it with loose wraps. It doesn't have to be tight. Just loose wraps. And that thread pressure ultimately pushed that tail back down. So just basically use your thread as your friend instead of basically treating it like an enemy. And then now we're going to go back and we're going to trim the butt ends. But before I trim the butt ends, since we're going to tie in a wing right here and there's going to be a thorax area right there, I want this wing to be trimmed in a transition. So I'm going to cut it almost like a ramp. And that way, when I run my thread back over these butt ends, it has a nice little taper that's already built for you. And all I'm going to do is just jump my thread forward and roughly cover these butt ends. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. And as you can see right now, there's already a taper that's built. I'm going to do my final wraps here with the tail to get it the position I want. The next step. And this particular pattern is the wire. So when a lot of people tie a royal stimulator, they'll just tie in the peacock curl, they'll tie in the, the red mid session the section, and then they kind of like forego the wire like you would with a traditional stimulator where you're basically reinforcing the hackle. Well, there's no reason on earth why you shouldn't reinforce the peacock curl with this wire. And it also adds a little bit to the overall appearance of the fly where you have the ribbed red section, the midsection of this fly, and it sort of gives it the candy cane effect. I like tying this fly, especially for during the winter months where, uh, or right before Christmas, and then give them out in like little glass ornaments for uh, basically Christmas ornaments. Got one little hair here that rolled on me that is bugging me. So I'm just going over there, pull it out with my tweezers. All right, the peacock curl. So this is the part that a lot of my buddies always end up struggling with when they're tying a royal stimulator or anything that requires hurl. I'm going to go there like to the base of the eye. See how nice and fluffy it is instead of using the strong peacock curl packs. And I'm going to go right here about the middle and grab a couple strands of hurl. When you're using peacock curl, what you want to do is you want to trim the tips. The tips are the most brittle part of the hurl. The whole thing is very fragile to begin with, but the tip is the most brittle. I'm just going to trim that out nice and flush. And I'm going to tie it in like normal. Don't use too much pressure with the hurl. Otherwise, your thread will cut that hurl. So one of the ways I reinforce this hurl is instead of just wrapping it, like a lot of people do at this point, I'll wrap it around the thread itself. 
thread I'm using is GSP. It's already a very strong thread. So by reinforcing it here with the thread, if a part of this hurl does break, there's other parts that's wrapped up around that thread and it's going to prevent the whole thing from basically just coming undone. I take one additional steps before I actually start wrapping this itself where I'll put a little bit of head cement. Super glue works just as fine. Roughly about that area where I'm going to wrap the hurl. And it just adds an additional layer of durability to the fly so that it will stand several fish. And then you can either wrap it by hand or use the rotary function on your vise if you got one. And now you just begin wrapping that hurl. You get that nice bushy backside to the stimulator. And then tie it off. Generally, I like to do about three wraps behind and then three wraps up front, and that material is pretty much well tied in. String right here. All right, so we're not touching this, this wire just yet, because what we're going to do is we're going to tie in the midsection. The proper way to do that is by using floss. I'm going to show you that way. However, you could cheat. You, at this point right now, you could take this hurl, you can wrap it all the way up to where basically the base of your wing is going to go. Finish out the fly or before you tie in the wing, you have basically wrap all your peacock up there, tie off the peacock, and then you come back with really thick thread like UTC 240 or 280, something like that. And whip finish this thread right here, go back in with a thick thread and basically just wrap your midsection. And then you have the midsection of basically a royal anything, whether it's a coachman or a stimulator one easy way to get that red mid midsection. But I do like to, to use floss. Floss has a nice sheen to it. For me, that's preferable than using thread. Cut out a length of this floss. This is just single strand, uni floss. And then I'm going to tie it in. So at this point right here, I want add a little bit of bulk to this midsection. You can do it one of two ways. You can continue to wrap more thread on there, or you could basically do the multiple wraps with the floss. Only problem with the floss is the more you wrap it, the more you're asking for something to go wrong because if you have a burr in your finger or you hit the hook point, whatever the case may be, that floss can fray and come undone. So I do just a little bit of like basically a uh, combination of two where I'll build a little bit of a bulk with my thread and then I'll wrap it forward with the floss. While I'm doing this, I'm just slowly basically uncork or unwinding this thread right here, uncording it in order to flatten it out as best as I can. And then once I have that midsection filled, do three wraps in front, then did one, and then now two more in the back. I know you got that wire that's hanging back there and your natural inclination is just basically just start wrapping with it right away. You still got one more section of hurl to do. So I'm just going to tie in that next section real quick. And I'm going to show you what I do with that wire. Just like I did for the hurl in the rear, I'm going to trim off the tips. This section here is going to be a little bit smaller. I'm going to use the exact same te techniques that I use for the rear hurl and pour it around my thread. Add a little bit of head cement, make it more durable. And then just build up this little ball of hurl up here. Doesn't need to be a whole lot. One wrap behind, three in front, and then two more. I try to keep the way I wrap or tie off materials, whether it's the three in front, three in the rear, from fly to fly to fly. The only thing that's changing is the size of my thread. 
in order for me to maintain that same consistency across each of those each of the flies. So now at this point right here, you have your wire. This wire right here is pretty much going to be hidden in the hurl, but it just again reinforces it. So now you've done basically three things in order to make this hurl more durable. First was cording it around the thread. Second was laying down a little bit of head cement or super glue. And then now you're going back in there and just basically wrapping wire through it. So when a fish does take this fly, it's not going to fall apart on you right away. And then I run the wire. This is extra small wire. It weighs like next to nothing. It doesn't affect how this fly is going to float at all because you have so much uh, elk hair and tackle and everything else that's going to be on this fly that will prevent it basically from having any detrimental effects. And then I run it all the way through the hurl up front and then just helicopter it off. And then right there, the body of the fly is done, adding that little bit of tiny red beer through the, the floss, adds a little bit more to the durability, but it also gives it that nice candy cane effect. The peacock hurl now is being reinforced with three different techniques. Fish takes this and ain't gonna fall apart on you. Next is the wing. Exact same technique as the tail where I threw the elk hair in the stacker to align the tips. Check all these tips here, make sure that they're lined up, everything looks good. And then I'm gonna measure this out. I want this wing to be roughly about halfway to the tail when I tie it in. Because once you tie it in, just because it's sitting there like this way, it does not mean that the wing's gonna be that length specifically because once you put the pressure on it, the wing's going to push up. So I want this wing to basically look like this here once it flares up. Then I changed finger using the pinch wrap method again. Start securing this hair. Two wraps to, to basically secure it. Now I'm going to run my thread through these butt ends to make sure that it's properly secure and then take it right back to where I started. That hair ain't gonna go anywhere. Take my scissors to the best that I can. I'll try to trim slight taper with that hair. So that way when we go in and dub the thorax, you already have a taper that's somewhat built. And then all it is is just going back in and trimming the remainder of your butt ends. The downside to these scissors, because they're so sharp, is even if you're using GSP and it's all wrapped up on the hook already, you could accidentally go in there and cut everything off. When I first started using these scissors, that happened to me. It gets to be very frustrating when you get to the point where you tie basically a 90% completed fly and you go back in there and snip your thread. And whoops, the whole fly falls apart, especially when you're tying like a big articulated fly or something. The benefits of having super sharp scissors is, is I can't stress that enough between having a vise that securely holds your hook and that hook does not pop loose or move at all and sharp, sharp scissors. Those are the, probably the two most important things when it comes to time flies. So I have a slight taper built here. Now I wanna go back, I'm gonna cover these butt ends the best I can. It does not have to be perfect because you're gonna cover a lot of these up with dubbing. All right, so the same thing as the tail. Basically, wing, because I needed to securely uh, or tighten the, the hair down there or the, to properly secure it, it's flaring up way too high. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically grab a hold of the wing. And I'm going to go back, just loose wraps with my thread, and then work my way forward. Now I'm using that thread to my advantage and basically pushes that wing down. And there's a We've got our frozen screen on you. Say again? Your screen is frozen. Okay. Anybody hey, else's screen frozen? No, sir. I'm good. Okay. Yeah, I think all it's right. your computer. Here. It is fine. It's been freezing, though, for me all along, uh, off and on. Ah, it's been good all the way through for 
for me. Same yeah, I think here. It's good all the way through for me too. Good for me. I think it's de uh, dependent upon somebody's co your connection is why it might be freezing. Because it's been fluid on mine. All right, so you pretty much have the baseline of that stimulator look just about done. Now the key part, the hackle. So I already sized out this hackle. What I like to do when I prep my hackle is I'll preen one side of the hackle slightly more than the other. The reason I do that is I want that first wrap to be the stem that's hitting the shank of the hook. And that way you're controlling where that hackle is going to go. Whereas if you just basically leave it even on both sides and that hackle, the first thing that's gonna hit it is a bunch of barbs. And now you're losing that control. Uh, you'll see also on social media, a lot of people will preen off like one side of the hackle to get the nice, pretty looking wraps. Absolutely unnecessary to do that. You're All you're doing is just wasting a good quality hackle. When you do that, you can get good quality wraps with your hackle by basically using the full thing with these techniques I'm about to show you. Other thing I like to do with my dry flies, regardless of the fly that I'm tying, is get some butt ends that are a little bit too long here. Red zapper, your best friend. What is that you're using? This is called a thread zap. It's basically an embroidery tool that basically just cauterizes, or in this case, it's electro. Yeah. They're like $14, $15. You can buy them at Joann's, Michael's, or anywhere. And it's wow. Uh, seems Thank just, you. They basically use this to burn off thread. It also burns off materials real well, too. So at this point right here, you could wrap this hackle and basically call it a day. What I like to do with basically any dry fly that I, I'm tying, I like to add a small amount of dubbing to right before I wrap. There's two reasons for that. One, with this fly specifically, uh, we're going with like basically the royal theme. So I want to cover up this black thread. Could I have used red thread instead and had that entire thorax just basically thread base? Yes. But I knew I was going to go in there and basically add some dubbing. So what I'm doing is basically I'm just doing a little bit of touch dubbing right here. Whatever amount that you think you may need for dubbing, reduce that by two-thirds. And that's the actual amount of dubbing you should actually use. Dubbing, people have a tendency to overdub by adding too much. If you're using super fine or any of these dry fly dubbing, once you get it on there, it's almost impossible to get off. And you're going to have to basically just sit there and pick at it or cut the whole thing off. So just go a small amount, just enough to basically just cover the thread. I don't have a whole lot on here. So what I'm doing is I'm going to, one, turn this thorax here red. But two, the second reason why I like to add dry fly dubbing before wrapping any type of hackle is dry fly hackle, the barbs are really stiff. And by adding just a little bit of dubbing right here, it basically allows the something for the barbs to really bite into. And that adds a little bit more to that durability of that, the fly. At this point right now, the weakest part of your fly is your, your hackle. Your elk ain't going to fall apart. Your peacock curl has basically been reinforced multiple times. Your floss has been reinforced with the, the wire. So the hackle is your weakest link. And the way that you prevent that is to basically just add a little bit of dubbing. If you are going to use just thread, you could also add a, a, a base of just base of head cement before you wrap. Like I said, I like to have flies last. So wrapping the hackle. What I do on that first wrap, as you can see right now, as I wrap it, because I strip that slightly bit on that one side, that hackle is just going to go however way I want it. If I want to go over here, if I want to go here, it's going to go because it's just that bare stem that's hitting it. Now, that hackle is gonna to start to splay. I get that first couple wraps in. 
I'll start applying more pressure even. Those barbs are now biting into that dubbing. And at that point right there, I can tie it off. And when you go in there and trim, just be careful you don't cut your thread. At this point, you have any barbs that are just had video change. Modding reel too. Yeah, I think we Do lost. You know who, yeah. Who made it? What were the scissors again? Just curious. They're a German um, brand. Um, Renameds, R E N O N. Yeah, Renameds. There we go. Yep. 50 bucks. Whoa. I mean, we got German knives we bought in 1960, we're still using. So if again. I remember, they come out of Salt Lake. There's a distributor there, but I'm not sure. Probably a medical grade scissors. They are. Yeah. yeah. So after How do you, you spell, spell that again on the on the R E N O M E D is yeah. a medicine. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Just like yeah, thank you. Just like if you look on Zoll again, you can see with two like Heinkels, you can see two or one, and they'll tell you whether it's made in Germany, or whether it's made in Brazil or somewhere else. So there's good German steel and there's bad German steel or branded as German steel. Rick, I don't know if you've got a phone number for him. You might want to text him, make sure he knows he's not connected anymore. Yeah, I do. I got to get to it. He sent it to me just before we started, just in case. Uh... Regarding the thread zapper, does anyone know if that's battery powered or electric? It's battery. Battery. Yeah, it. Thank you. Oh, fine. Fifteen dollars on Amazon. I just ordered it. There are two models. Perfect. Thank you very much. Two double A's, and the other one has a single double A. You can get different ones that are rechargeable, just a different brand. Yeah. If you have a friend that's a surgeon, that's electro cautery that they use and they're disposable. They're really, uh, so you could maybe get one from a surgeon. <laughs> that's, well, that's, where, that, that's where I got mine was, I've got four or five of them here from a buddy that used to work in the surgery room. I can ask one of my doc friends if he can come up with, oh, you know what, he's got electro cautery. Because he's used it on me before. The electro motor. Ah, there you are. It's hard to beat the 15 bucks at Joanne's, though. <laughs> and they have replaceable tips in case you burn through one. I asked my wife, who does a lots of sewing. I mean, lots and lots of sewing. You got one? No. Don't have a need for one. What do they do? <laughs> I just tried to call him and... Uh... It went to voicemail. I'm sure he's scrambling to try and get back on. He's got another tie, a fly to tie, which is cool. What he did was cool. I really liked it a lot. Oh, yeah. It was, I was sitting here, nose up against the screen. What kind of thread was he using? It's that, um, GSP. GSP. Yeah. It's, 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 it's real. Real. He no, used Semperfly Nano Silk. Right. Yeah. What's that? Semperfly. Semperfly. Yeah. yeah, like in the Marines. Right. I got it. I remember Nanos. when he first started tying, he did some stuff for us at Healing Waters. He's amazing. Yeah, he, he's super on this. And yeah, I'm thinking he's running technical. 
issues that he dropped Hello? off. Oh. Hey, Amy. Hey, hey Amy. how are you? Puttering. We're getting out of the cold weather, guys. We might, we're above freezing for once. Really? <laughs> send it, send it my direction. We, we made the news yesterday with our ice. Yeah, we, we might get ice tomorrow night. We'll have to see. We're going to Lincoln to work on some rods for part of the uh, Cornhusker, uh, Fly Fishers, State of Nebraska. They do a fly rod building, you know, and Project Human yep. Waters is helping out there also. So right. I'll go down there for tomorrow. Hopefully just we don't have the second slide. What? No, just, just gave Why don't we, uh... or, or GNP. Okay, there you go. There you go. Rick, have you have we found him yet? No, I keep getting voicemail. Why don't we uh, pause the uh, recording for now until we figure out what's going on? All right. So the basically the part that uh, you guys ended up missing out on was when uh, before I did the the trim of, of the thread, I added a little bit of head cement on the actual thread itself, and did wraps with it in order to reinforce that snip that i did it's usually one of the weakest points once you cut off the hackle is wherever you cut off the you trim that hackle off is basically uh the way the way you avoid it basically falling apart on you is just add a dab of either head cement or uv resin onto the thread itself wrap over it and then once it dries or you cure it then it's just one added layer of durability then when i went into the whip finish uh, again, I added a little bit of the head cement on there, whip finish, snipped my thread, and that was pretty much the fly. Is that about the gist of where you guys got left off was basically uh, doing the whip finish or cutting yep, out the hackle? Correct. Okay. Yes. So right there is the uh, the finished fly. Again, the little red tag right there draws their attention. You can tie this in a wide variety of different colors. It could be purple. It could be blue. It could be... Green, so, red. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, sorry. When we lost you, you were doing the stimulator. I don't know what that is you have in the vice now, but that's not what you were tying before. Oh, you lost me at the stimulator. I was tying this for like the last ten. Minutes. Yeah. yeah, you did yeah, the we... uh, wing and did the hack on the stimulator when we lost you. Okay. Yeah. So let me pull up. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No, no. I'm glad you told me. I thought I was receiving a spam call <laughs> when Rick was calling. So there's the simulator. <laughs> oh yeah. And basically, well, when I did the uh, the whip finish on this, lost him again. There he goes again. Again. Ouch. Something about that stimulator that the the gods don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Big thing when it comes to to flies. People tie flies for different reasons. Some tie for just the therapeutic aspect of it. Others tie in order to fill their fly boxes to fish. I've tied for a combination of both, but when I do go fish with those same flies, I want those flies to withstand a lot of fish instead of falling apart. And that's the beauty behind being a fly tire is that you can uh, add all these additional or take um, necessary steps in order to make a more durable fly versus picking one out of a fly uh, bin somewhere and head to the stream and next you know that thing falls apart on you after like one fish. And this is one of these patterns that has a uh, reputation of falling apart because peacock curl has that bad rep to it. And it's, it's finicky and it, it's brittle and it falls apart. This here was reinforced with basically three different ways. So I've had these same flies where I've taken up to the Alpine Lakes in Colorado after 24, 25, 30 fish, they were, it was still, I mean, there were pieces that were brittle that were cut from their teeth, but the integrity of each of the ends were still in place because I had reinforced it with thread, reinforced it with wire, in addition to a little bit of the uh, head cement and super glue. And you can do that with any dry flies. Everybody thinks the dry flies are very brittle. They fall apart. But if you take the right steps and you apply these techniques to it, you will have your dry flies withstand at least.
And I believe we lost him again. Yes, we did. Tool. In most cases, you have something on your desk already that probably has a half hitch built into it. Sure. Like, for example, this Botkin. Yeah. That's one that's really big. Threaders. Or if you don't want to get anything, you can even use your fingers. Your fingers or a pencil, mechanical pencil or a pen. So there's yeah. a lot of stuff out there you can use in order to basically do a uh, seat your net or you're not properly before you cut your thread without having to use a whip finish tool, especially with big bushy flies. And that was the part that I was trying to get through for like three iterations before I kept on freezing up. <laughs> <laughs> you think, you think it's your camera that's causing I, it? Yeah. I the, like, I literally just bought this camera not long ago and I was using a Sony a seven R four before and it would, it would it streamed just fine. So I, I think it's a camera. So oh, okay. next time I do this, I still have my Sony. I'll just throw that one back on. This was just so clear, though. Yeah, it it uh, was a beautiful picture. Yes, it is. Yeah, it was. At least nice. you got like ninety eight percent of the fly done before it froze up. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of camera is it? It's a Sony uh, R seven. Uh, oh, okay. it, shoot, it shoots in 4K, and then um, I have uh, the 100 millimeter macro lens on there on top of that to stream with. So cool. That's that's why it comes in like super crystal clear. It's the same camera I use to shoot all my macros with and record my videos with. Hey, Sonny, that... you there was a Go lot ahead. of interest in the other fly you were tying. Would you kind of give us a little background and tell us a bit about it? Yeah. So uh, basically. Up the fly here, it's gonna be a little bit harder to see, but this is a coachman caddis. And what it basically is was, um, I fished the El Sable River up in Michigan many many years ago, and there's this one stretch that's approximately about a mile long. It obviously takes several hours to, to wade it to hit every nook and cranny, and it's filled to the brim with brook trout. Where basically, the most of that river has a ton of browns, but this particular stretch just has a lot of brook trout. And the whole thing is weightable. So I I was up there, had my bamboo rod, was just chucking dry flies over the place. And then there were all these caddises that were starting to come off. And all I had on me were some elk hair caddis. So I chucked that, caught a bunch of brook trout. But as I got to the point where um, I was looking at the water more closely and to take a look at these caddises that were coming off, there was a bunch of them that were like kind of like stuck. They were like trying to get out of uh, the surface film to dry off their wings and do their thing. So I wanted like basically a caddis merger and I combined a combination of a couple different things in order to, to tie this fly. One, brook trout for whatever reason, love red. And um, you, that's what I got the tag in for on this right here. Two, peacock curl is like one of my favorite materials, just catches fishes all over the world. And so that's where like the name, the coachman caddis came out of this. And I wanted it to mimic a caddis that was basically stuck in that surface film. And the easiest way to do that without throwing in like uh, all of this random different materials to create that effect is just use a curved hook. And with the elk hair wing, what it does is the elk hair is, and the, uh, the hackle is going to make that fly basically sit cockeyed like this here. That red tag in is going to be sitting there in that surface film. So when the trout swims by, they're going to see that little slight red flash from the uh, the tag end. And then when they actually look up, then they see the profile of the caddis itself. And it basically, it just mimics really, really well a bug that's stuck in that surface film. And you could tie it. It doesn't have to be with this red tinsel and this peacock arrow. You could tie it any standard caddis color. And I do this for the Mother's Day caddis, yellow sallies for stoneflies, black for... Uh, or some of the other caddises that I ran across while I was out in Colorado. So you get October caddis is another popular one that I used out there on the Gallatin and uh, the Madison. And you just change the color of your dubbing or uh, tinsel or whatever you're using for the body. And you, you get the exact same effect. The, the key thing is just having the properly proportioned elk hair, undersized hackle, and that red tag or whatever the case may be to, to sit down there so that it does draw their attention out of all the other thousands of millions or bugs or whatever that's basically coming off, you just need that one thing that they that basically catches their eye and then present a profile to that fly so that it looks like something that's struggling in the water that they'll eat. 
and these literally take like five minutes to tie. Can you What's get a close up of it? Second. Can you have a close up of it? I mean, just a, a closer picture. Is it possible? I'll try. I can't guarantee you oh. it's not going to freeze up again. Hopefully, then. Well, <laughs> one take, one snapshot, and then we'll put it up on the screen. Just curious. Okay. Thank you, sir. What's the hook size that you're dealing with there? This one here is a 14. Uh, you could do yeah. this all the way down to an 18 really easily. How about using That's a clink hammer hook on it? Uh, this is a check nymph hook, but any curve hook will work. All right. Knock on wood. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh. Bingo. Nice. Isn't that the coolest looking fly? So yeah. right there, like I said, the uh when they swim by, they're gonna basically see this because of the way you have the undersized hackle and that wing, so it basically sits in the water like this. So with that curved hook, that butt end sits there in that surface fill. And then underneath, they basically see that profile. And it just looks like a bug that's struggling to get out of that surface fill. This catches a lot of fish when basically there's any caddis that's in the water. Basically on simple hook design uh, and then utilizing material in order to give it that effect where now it's sitting like this here and that butt end sits there in the water. What, what like said, I'm sorry? What are you using for the uh, tag? Is it just thread with the... Uh... No, it's holographic tinsel. I wanted a little oh. bit of flash. You could, uh, I, I also have used uh, floss. I've used red thread or purple thread. Um, in this case right here, I have the tinsel, but the other ones also work pretty well too with just basically a thread tag or a floss tag. But the okay. tinsel, uh, I like a little bit better because one has that sheen to it. And then two, it doesn't soak up as much water compared to thread. And then all I do is just put a little bit of either head cement or UV resin to give it a light coating. And then it just makes it really, really adorable. And then the same techniques that I did with the stimulator, I applied to this, the peacock curl tube, by reinforcing around the thread and then adding a, a small amount of super glue or head cement to there before I wrap it up. And then it was, I mean, this here will stand probably like 20 to 30 brook trout before it falls apart. That is a cool fly. And they're really, really easy to tie. Maybe my class tomorrow night will be tying these instead of pheasant tail nymphs. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other the other great thing, like I said, about it is you can uh, you could change up the color scheme. Oh no. Oh no. Well, I think Holy. we determined the culprit. Yeah. He did last for the situation is I don't think Zoom can handle 4K, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, if, if I would have kept the presentation to, I think, like 45 minutes, then everything would have been completed in that time before it started, like, going overboard. But uh, at least we got, like I said, about 98% of the fly done before it started freezing up. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Sean, there was a question in the chat about a list of materials for the flies. Is that something you could maybe... Uh, send to Rick and we could distribute to the group? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I know you can't see it real well, and I don't want to put the – or let me put my regular camera back up. There we go. I know you can't see really well. Like this one right here is like an 18, and this here was using basically peccary to create that – that same body, but it has the exact same effect as that other fly with basically a caddis emerger. So that was my last point on that was it's really easy to tie this fly, but you could also tie in a wide variety of different materials and colors to mimic whatever. In this case here, I use peccary. But yeah, I'll I'll uh, put together a list of the materials uh, for both flies. And I'll send it to Rick. Great. Fantastic. How long did you have to soak your peccary to be able to uh, wrap it around like that? Uh, in warm water, uh, five minutes. Really? Cool. Yeah. If you're using warm water, it doesn't take any time, uh, much time at all. And then each one is going to be slightly different, 
based on the uh, the taxidermists or whoever based cured that that hide. Uh, if they they did a really good job of curing it, then it'll take a little bit longer to to uh, to soak. But generally, if you use warm water, it's about five minutes, ten minutes max. Mm -hmm. I even do the same thing with the peacock quills, where I'll soak it for about three minutes in warm water before I wrap it on there, and then that prevents the splitting also. Good ideas. Good advice. Thanks. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions for Sun? Yeah. What was the name of that river you were catching those brookies on? The Osable, up near Grayling, Michigan. Oh yeah, I used to I used to fish the Osable down near Ascoda for salmon in the fall. Great river that has just about every species of fish running through there, with maybe the exception of pike and muskie. But yep. it's a beautiful river, tannic yes, in is. color because of uh, all the the trees that are around there creates like this year round tan color river that is just full of wild browns, small population of rainbows, and then a ton of brook trout too. And then uh, it's it's like basically during the summertime it's dry fly heaven because you have constant hatches that. Starts in the morning all the way through the evening with the caddises coming off. And then you manage to get there during one of the, the hex hatches or the drake hatches. Then it's it's just like fish just explode like everywhere. One of my favorite rivers to fish. Biggest mistake the Air Force ever made was closing oh. Rhythmus. Okay. I didn't know that there were pike and muskie. I only ever fished uh, up the section up there by the uh, by grailing itself. So we never ran across any there. But it, that's good to know. <laughs> the Osable is the birthplace of Trout Unlimited. Yep. We floated by uh, the house where it all started. We uh, The first couple times I went up there, uh, we went through uh, Gates, the guy, uh, the fly shop that's up there. Oh, and that's yeah. the same one that John Garrick uses when he goes up. And my one, my one buddy went the one year. He invited me to come up. I couldn't because of the military. And then um, next thing you know, he, he sends me a picture and John Garrick was up there that same trip. <laughs> yeah i was very upset because i'm a big <laughs> eric man but they were out in the parking lot and basically <laughs> selfie like this right here and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> yeah he that, that's a very one. graphic statement it's a way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, well, in 200 years well we know what that means <laughs> Oh man! I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording at this point. Okay, good idea. I know you were still recording, otherwise. Too late, Rick. We we may hey. edit that part out. So yeah, yeah, yeah you might want to do that. Yeah, yeah, that might be the emperor.